Thank you. To the May 14th regular meeting of the Troy Planning Commission, copies of the agenda for tonight's meeting are available at the entrance to the room. <coughs> Additionally, the agenda and minutes of prior meetings are available on the city's website. The meeting will be conducted in accordance with the agenda as presented or amended by the Planning Commission. The roles and responsibilities of the Planning, Com <coughs> planning Commission are outlined on the reverse side of tonight's agenda. State law establishes planning commissions. The commission is comprised of nine members, all of whom have volunteered to serve. Members are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by city council. The other individuals seated at the table this evening are the representatives of the city's planning department, the city's attorney's office, and the city's planning consultant, Carlisle Wortman Associates. If you wish to address the planning commission, please come forward and rec when recognized and provide your name and address on the sign-in sheet. Please begin your remarks by stating your name for the benefit of the commissioners. All remarks are to be addressed to the Planning Commission, not to anyone else in the room. At this time, I ask that all cell phones, Blackberries, PDAs, or other devices that might disrupt this meeting please be placed in silent mode or turned off. And for items that are not uh, public hearings, I will provide an opportunity for public comment. The roll call, please. Mr. Edmonds? Here. Mr. Hudson? Here. Mr. Kempin? Here. Mr. Krent? Here. Mr. Zanzika? Here. Mr. Shepke? Mr. Schultz? Here. Mr. Stratt? Here. Mr. Tagle? Here. All right, second item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion? Move the agenda as prepared. Mr. Schultz? Second. Mr. Kempin? Second. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Kempin? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Mr. Zanzika? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Stratt? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Item number three will be the approval of the minutes from our April 23rd, 2013 special study meeting. Any comments, questions, or motion? I, I would move to, pub, uh, to approve as published. All right, Mr. Second. Edmonds. Second by Mr. Stratt. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kempin? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Mr. Zanzika? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Stratt? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. All right, item number four. Anyone in the audience like to speak on items that are not on the current agenda? All right, seeing no one, we'll get into our postponed items. Item number five. Special use and preliminary site plan review file number SU-401, proposed Midwest Industrial Metals, Inc. <laughs> 2222 Stevenson Highway, Section 26, currently zoned IB Integrated Industrial and Business District. Who will be reporting? Mr. Sauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on this item, the March regular meeting, and they, was post they postponed the item for two months till this evening to provide the applicant with an opportunity to submit a revised site plan that uh, incorporated some of the concerns of the neighbors and some of the concerns of the of the Planning Commission. Also uh, provided the city staff an opportunity to monitor the site, um, check for progress um, on, on proposed improvements, um, monitor noise levels, other, other items such as that. The applicant did not submit a revised site plan until yesterday. So staff has not had an opportunity to review the site plan. We have not provided the site plan to the Planning Commission because we haven't even reviewed it yet. So at this point, Mr. Chairman, we recommend postponement of this item until the June regular meeting, June 11th meeting. Okay. Anyone on the Commission have any questions or concerns in doing so? Could I add we, one thing, Mr. Chairman? Absolutely. We've got some correspondence here, uh, two, uh, two emails from Peggy Hammond. One was uh, submitted April 5th, one was submitted May 13th. I just wanted, if she's here, to make it clear that we, we did forward the, their concerns uh, to the Planning Commission yeah. for your consideration. Do you need any official action on this to postpone? Yeah, we would like uh, official postponement to the June 11th meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Stratt, second. <clears throat> Mr. Krent? Yes. Mr. Tanzika? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Stratt? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Hudson? <laughs> yes. Mr. Kempen? Yes. Mr. Tagle, could I add one more thing? Certainly. Anyone who's in the audience to uh, speak on this matter, if you would like to review the site plan, you can come to the to Planning Commission counter. I would be happy to let you look at the plan. You can call the Planning Department. We can email it to you. 
and anything we can do to be transparent and provide the copies of to you, we, we will do so. Okay, great. All right, our second postponed item, item number six, it's a public hearing, special use and preliminary site plan review, file number SU404, proposed United Ventures 2 LLC, west of John R, north of Maple, 1861 Birchwood, section 26, currently zoned IB, integrated business and industri excuse me, industrial and business district. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening. Um, if the Planning Commission um, would remember, this item came, um, was before the Planning Commission, uh, I believe a, a few months ago, in regards um, to a special use uh, for a contractor's yard located at 1861 Birchwood. The item had to go in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals because there is a provision in the zoning ordinance that requires a contractor's yard to be accessory to a, a building on the site. Um, the applicant did receive a variance from that provision, which allowed uh, the operation of this uh, facility to be used as a contractor's yard without a building. However, um, this variance is contingent upon getting special use approval, as well as contingent upon getting site plan approval um, from the Planning Commission. The receiving of this variance does not behold the Planning Commission to grant a special use approval for the site um, until the, the Planning Commission can determine that all appropriate standards have been met. Um, just for a little refresher on the property itself, um, it did receive a special use permit in 1982 to allow um, a contractor's and storage yard, um, but that was capped at a maximum of six vehicles. The six vehicles was based on testimony from the then planning director um, at, during that time. Um, since the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, meeting, we have been working with the applicant in regarding to the submission of a site plan um, and a maneuvering plan. Those plans have been submitted in your packet for review. Um, we have reviewed them as well as the city's traffic consultant and the city's traffic engineer. Um, all three of our comments are pretty consistent in regards to the site plan and the maneuvering plan. Um, we find that due to a number of concerns, um, including operation, logistics, circulation, um, that the number of vehicles proposed and the associated parking for employee parking on the site um, does not allow for uh, a safe usage of this, of this facility. Um, the most concerning issue in regards to the number of vehicles posed is the potential for spillover um, and extension of the use onto Birchwood uh, Road itself. That road already um, experiences a number of parking and circulation problems due to other land uses on there, and so the feeling is the number of vehicles that's proposed by the applicant will just exacerbate the issue already on Birchwood. Um, in addition, we have a few other concerns with the site plan, including uh, the, the amount of landscaping they provided as well as uh, the deficiency in employee uh, parking. But that's all based on the number of vehicles that they propose. So in, um, in review, uh, we recommend um, based on our review as well as the traffic engineers and the traffic engineering consultants review that the applicant um, revise their site plan um, and resubmit with, a, with less vehicles proposed for, for storage there. The number of vehicles, I, I don't have a good number to tell you what that number should be. Um, I think there was a rational relationship why six was chosen in 1982. The property has not changed dimensions since that time. Um, but really based on a circulation, a revised circulation maneuvering plan, we can better assess whether how many vehicles up and above six should be permitted at this site. Um, but that's the direction from, uh, from us as well as from the traffic engineer. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Carlisle? Is the petitioner here? Like to step forward and add any comments or to the presentation? <coughs> Nathan Robinson with Horizon Engineering. I'm here with Mr. John Warness of United Ventures. <coughs> I think initially, uh, what I uh, the first um, maybe it's more of a question than a comment is that obviously there's certain concerns that are um, indicated in the review. And we're wondering, is it at all possible to still move forward and seek approval of the site plan? Um, it's our feeling that with the way it's currently laid out with the number of vehicles and the maneuvering that, um, that it works, uh, certainly if we need to take a couple vehicles off, we're willing to do that. If it's right now, currently we've got 11 uh, work trucks, truck trailer combination shown, we can go down to nine and uh, we can certainly change the employee parking if it's a 
two to one ratio. If that's the number that uh, the city feels comfortable with, we can certainly provide that and go with 18 employee parking spaces. In reality, um, because they, because United uses uh, passenger vans or shuttles to bring their employees to the site, uh, uh, the, the two to one ratio is probably actually too much. It's more like one to one. It could even be less than that. Uh, a passenger van could hold, what, 10 to 15, uh, up to 15 employees. And they could be, there could be three cargo van, or excuse me, passenger vans that would significantly reduce the number of employee vehicles that are parked on the site. So um, setting a specific number of vehicles on the property has always been difficult from the beginning of this project because in, in reality, we're going to try to bring as many people with as little vehicles as possible. Um, and I can go through the, the, the comments and, and address some of the concerns if the, if the Planning Commission feels that there is a chance that we could push forward and try and seek an approval tonight as opposed to postponing it, if, if you want me to spend the time doing that. Any questions for the petitioner? Not for the petitioner, no. Pardon me? Not for the petitioner, no. <coughs> well, I, I will make a comment based on what you're saying. Uh, I don't know what the commission's flavor is on this. Um, and, I, and I know you have presented with all good intentions, but what's to say that something may go awry? I mean, I read in the report from the traffic consultant, what if one of the trucks has a flat tire or an engine doesn't start? Where are you gonna pile your snow in the winter? I mean, you know, it's such a tight <coughs> site right now you know, there's no way you can guarantee that what we're seeing in, on a CAD drawing is really going to be the reality out there. And I think, as Mr. Carlisle said, the concern is the, the operation bleeding out onto the street and, and causing more congestion and, and issues out on the street. So, It, it is our objective. Just, um, just a couple of quick notes. Oh, sorry to jump in, Nathan. But um, wintertime, for example, the site's not going to have trailers on it. The trailers are going to be eliminated in the, uh, from December 1st all the way until April 1st. They'll go back to our main location for service. Um, as far as like breakdowns, engines not starting, uh, I don't know how many of you folks are familiar with our operational company, which is United Lawnscape, but we're always up to date. Newer equipment, we don't, you know, we don't really run anything that's um, older than five years old, you know, on the road. Um, and operationally, I mean, we keep things up and and. We have, um, like I mentioned at the, uh, at the ZBA meeting, we have multiple sites that we operate out of. And believe it or not, some of them are actually smaller than this. And you know, we, we don't have a problem blocking traffic on the road out front. We don't have issues you know, inside with vehicles running into one another. You know, it's kind of, I know it kind of seems kind of like everything's gotta be kind of synchronized, but believe it or not, um, the way we operate with staggered start times and different things like that, we're very confident that we can operate what we have here out of that site pr pretty simply on a regular basis without running into it issues on uh, Birchwood. Um, another example as far as like employee parking, if we had nine um, truck trailer combinations or nine crews that worked out of the um, facility, you, we would have roughly at a max 30 employees reporting and half of those at least would show up um, daily in a passenger van, you know? So, I mean, that would actually be, if everybody else drove a car in specifically, which normally they don't, people carpool, um, we would have a maximum of one a passenger van and 15 cars, so that would be 16 vehicles, you know? Um, and our intentions are not to get ourselves in a situation where we are too overly packed on that site. You know, our, our, our objective is to be able to cleanly operate without having operational issues on that site. And another thing we do recognize too um, that we have mentioned in the past is our intentions here um, are to expand on that location. Once we're to capacity, we open up another satellite location within a 10 mile radius. And then it would limit, again, it would limit the vehicles that are in that uh, site again until we <coughs> build up our density again, you know, with vehicles. A couple of things that I'll add. Uh, he mentioned st staggered start-stop times and how this is going to be. 
in our discussions um, with the planning staff, uh, the term was thrown out, synchronized ballet, in order to get this to work. And, but that's exactly how this is going to operate. He's going to have a site superintendent in charge of making sure that the crews arrive on time and at intervals so that we don't have everybody arriving in the morning all at one time. We don't have everybody arriving in the afternoon all at one time. Uh, it, it has to be an organized, staggered operation in order for this site to be successful because we're, we're very much aware that the city is sensitive to uh, the traffic on Birchwood, keeping people off of Birchwood, uh, not only for parking, but uh, maneuvering. Uh, one of the concerns in the comments was maneuvering on site with this, with, with the vehicles, specifically the, the truck trailer combinations. One of the very first things that United did before they even purchased the property was bring their truck and trailer combination to the site and, and, turn, and did a U-turn without a problem. Um, the drawings that I provided show, and it's mentioned in the review comments, that it's a tight radius. That's not the case. Um, they made the U-turn with no problem. Um, in the, uh, the turning templates and, the, and the, the software that I've used to indicate the maneuvering paths and the sweep paths for the vehicles, it actually g can give me to be technical about it in the computer. To, it can, I can actually get a tighter radius. I didn't show it that way because, I mean, you think about it. If, if you're making a U-turn and you have extra space, you're going to take that extra space. If there's no need to turn the wheels all the way, you're not going to do that. So certainly, um, with the width that's given there, they don't need to turn the wheels all the way, they, but they certainly could. They, they, that radius that's shown on there can be tighter, tighter if it needs to be. Uh, basically, what I was trying to illustrate on those maneuvering site plans is that how does the employee parking affect the maneuvering area? Can a, a truck trailer combination get into the site, do its U-turn and park into its place? And based on the number of employee vehicles that we expect, that should not be a problem. Um, there was also some comments in there about the spacing between vehicles. <coughs> and because this is in CAD and I drew it, I know that these vehicles are spaced nine and a half feet apart. On center. So while I don't show parking stripes per se, the standard parking space stall is nine and a half feet wide. These all these vehicles, employee vehicles, the, the work trucks are all spaced nine and a half feet on center. Um, the work trucks are Ford F-150 or excuse me, Ford F-350s, uh, typical truck that you'd see in any, any normal parking lot. So if these vehicles could park in a normal parking situation and be able to get in and out of their doors. The same would apply in this situation, so we don't really see an issue with um, the employees being able to get in and out of their vehicles. Um, and I think that that's hits, I think, the, the bulk of the concerns. There was a, a couple other items in the, uh, the comments that, well, I'll just be upfront and honest that were a little surprising to me in terms of the landscaping, the 20% uh, landscape open space and the parking lot trees that are required. I was surprised that that appeared in the comments this uh, far into the process. I don't know, it was my understanding from, from the onset that those requirements would not apply to this site uh, because this is basically an existing developed piece of property that we're just using for a different purpose. Um, certainly, th I did not provide landscape open space calculations on the site plan but I can almost guarantee you that it is probably below the 20%. Certainly, I don't show any parking lot landscaping trees, uh, so I, I think we would need some clarification on are those, do those requirements actually apply to this property? Um, because if we are short on the 20% open space, we're certainly, that's not something that we were looking to do to cut out asphalt to plant trees in, the, in an enclosed area where no one's going to see the trees except for their own employees. So I, I, I would ask for clarification on that. Um, certainly, if anybody has any other questions, be happy to. Any other as far as landscape, being a, being a landscape company, it's gonna the site's gonna look nice, always <laughs> landscape wise. Any other questions or comments with regards to the presentation? All right, yeah. nope. Mr. Edmonds. You say you have these tight of facilities in other operations and similar vehicles. Tell us about those facilities. Where's the nearest one? And uh, have you had any complaints? I'll tell you. And be honest, please. Okay, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you this 
it might sound kind of crazy. We have a 10,000 square foot um, uh, pad, all asphalt fenced, with a 2,000 square foot building on it in Villa Park, Illinois. We operate eight crew trucks and trailers out of it. They are all, um, believe it or not, they're, they're actually bigger trucks, they're actually dump trucks on that site. Um, there is, to be honest, there's a parking lot in front where the trucks come in, they do a little loop, and they back into the yard, and they park eight of them. Um, and it's a very, very, very tight spot on 10,000 square foot, less 2,000 square foot building there. We have a facility in um, Lansing. Um, it is a, believe it or not, it is a tennis court. It's an old tennis court within the city limits that we lease from the city of Lansing that we park um, six truck, trucks and trailers in, pull in, do all of our spin arounds and all that kind of stuff. Everything parks, all the employee cars park there. Um, never an issue with running into vehicles, never an issue with pulling out and, and uh, you know, blocking traffic of any sort. Um, of course, we have, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, we have a large facility in Washington Township, which is our, our main headquarters um, on Van Dyke at uh, 28 and a half mile road. Of course, that's an extremely large facility, uh, you know, with nurseries and um, retail facilities and operational, um, an operational company as well. Um, but we have a, a number of different locations. The smallest ones, the Villa Park and the um, Lansing uh, uh, places of business are, are just as tight as this, if not tighter in respect to the Villa Park address. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Kemp, yeah, you I have did, a question? I had a question about the vehicles. So these are like standard lawn maintenance vehicles or trailers, you know, inside of trailers with, a, say, a pickup truck type front. There are pickup trucks, um, um, extended cab, short bed pickup trucks with um, enclosed trailers attached to them. Okay, I'm just trying to <clears throat> do what I can to com comprehend what, how it was originally approved with six vehicles as a construction yard versus uh, the type of vehicles that you're proposing, which, which may be smaller than the ones that were originally. Believe it or not, originally it was operated as a um, as a storage facility for um, for tractor um, tractor trailer um, courier service for the, for the postal service is what it was was not fenced you could see it from all angles um, when I had uh, first met with Brent we looked at aerial uh, views of it over the course of the last 20 years or whatever it was and um, I mean there were 20 to 25 vehicles inside of that uh, on that site not fenced in. Um, there wasn't any recollection of you know complaints from neighbors and stuff like that, which we're good neighbors. Um, we've already pulled a permit, put in, uh, put up a screen fence um, along back and alongside, and put a new gate in the front and stuff like that. Um, for what we're trying to do, we're very confident we can operate and be great neighbors and be a great part of the community. Truly. All set, Mr. Kempen. Well, well one, one, one more question. Uh, it seems like you're in a little bit of a rush. I assume that, I, are you able to operate right now on that site as is? Well, or? we are operating with um, six vehicles on the site. Six vehicles. Um, and of course it did kind of come up to a time crunch. We were hoping to actually um, have everything situated by um, April 1st. We are operating there. Um, but we want to have this all situated so we can do what we have to do and you know put it all together and operate <coughs> efficiently as possible when he first looked at the if i may add when he first looked at the property he had an, an op, it was an option to purchase the property and he had a, a 30 days 45 days whatever it was contingency and it was contingent upon site plan approval so we had moved forward and submitted a site plan for review shortly before the first planning commission meeting it was determined that the site plan wasn't compliant because of the building issue so we had to go to the zba so it, the process has taken a little longer than we anticipated, but because his due diligence per period was running out, he had to either abandon the project completely or close on the deal. So in good faith, um, proceeding with the application process and just knowing his own 
from his own experience that he's confident that this site will work, he decided to close on the property and, and continue moving forward. So we went to the Zoning Board of Appeals, came back here with the revised site plan, and likewise has moved forward with fence permitting and up using the site for what it's currently approved for for the six vehicles. So time is a little bit of, of an essence um, because it's taking a little longer, but we realize we have to go step by step. So. All set? Yes. All right. Question for staff. <clears throat> Ms. Bloom or Mr. Savina, if the Planning Commission were to move forward and make a ruling on this tonight and the petitioner is unsuccessful, what is the impact on them at this point? Do they have to reapply and start over again? I don't understand what you mean by impact. If we don't approve the site plan as they're asking us to do mm -hmm. tonight. What is the impact on the petitioner moving forward? The petitioner would not be able to exceed six vehicles on the site. And if they wanted to do so, they'd have to reapply and file a new site plan or re refile the same site plan? Well, I, I guess uh, I don't know if we would necessarily be obligated to accept the site plan because what conditions would have changed from the from the from the time that we, that the Planning Commission denies this, the special use request, they resubmit what's changed, what's gonna, what's gonna make a, what's gonna, how, why would the Planning Commission come up with a different outcome if no conditions have changed? Do you want to? Do, do you need me to expand on, on that as well? I mean, it, it, it would be probably a new application, you're, you're correct, um, in that, you know, they would have to, again, as Mr. Savadon has said, they'd have to show, though, a change in circumstances, whatever their new plan was. Um, you know, you, you do have discretion, and, but they'd need to, to establish how that should be changed, what the major circumstantial change is. So I, I suppose, I suppose theoretically, we're only speaking theoretically because we haven't voted, but so in theory, they show, they show 11, 11 trucks, they're, they're denied, they come back and they show eight. I mean, I guess that's a change, that's a change in circumstance, as an example. But they could continue, if I may, they can continue using it with six trucks in its current state without privacy fences, they will, they, it's fenced now. Oh, it is? But they could continue to use those six, correct. Hmm. Mr. Stratt, do you have a question? <coughs> yeah, I have a question, Petitioner. Uh, did you submit uh, all the items that you just spoke to us about in writing to the staff? For, for the most part, um, not addressing some of the concerns, the more recent concerns, such as the 20% landscape open space and the parking lot trees, that, that's something that's new that just came up. I mean, I obviously I realize it's an ordinance requirement. I run into that on other projects, but understanding initially that that didn't apply to the site, this was the first time I've seen it in this review. So that previously on this project has not been addressed, but for the most part, we've had, I've had several letters of correspondence submitted along with the revised site plans that pretty much describe in a fair amount of detail our intent. And I thought that for the most part, these items were covered in, in the correspondence, but you know there could be little nuances here and there about the spacing between the vehicles, nine and a half feet, that is by default. So I didn't specifically indicate that dimensionally on the site plan, nor is it indicated specifically in the letter. So there's some little nuances here and there, but. My primary concern is, did you address the fact that you have a unique way of your staff coming, et cetera, that you presented to us, the staffing, the time, the elements that were involved? Did you present that to them as well in writing? In a, in a general fashion, correct. Not with specific times. Okay, 7.30, this is what's gonna happen, and then 7.45, this is what's going to happen. Oh, the but, unique way that you're staffing, isn't it rather unique? You oh, said sure. that it's staggered, and it's yes, unique that you're not, you don't have all the cars there at, all at one time. And that was indicated in our correspondence. Thank you. I, I believe the, in, the intent, I don't wanna speak for Mr. Robinson, but I believe the intent was 
the maneuvering plan was an attempt to show the staggering and to show the relationship between the out incoming or outgoing trucks and trailers and the incoming and outgoing personal vehicles. Of staff? Yes, with, through the maneuvering plan. Thank you. Anyone else? A question for staff? Hang on, Mr. Crint had his hand up. Uh, <coughs> this would be a question to the uh, petitioner. Uh, <coughs> you know, you really feel confident that 11 trucks with trailers can maneuver in and out of that without anybody parking on Birchwood? With, without what? Any, any employee parking on Birchwood? Well, <coughs> it popped up um, um, briefly, I think, at the ZBA meeting. We're not going to block Birchwood. We're not going to park on Birchwood. We're not going to block Birchwood. There's other facilities. There's literally a massive facility that we take care of right down the street um, that we can always opt to park cars if for some reason we have too many cars. And we have shuttle vans to you know move employees back and forth. And it's literally not even a half mile down the street. Um, but with, with the way our count of employees is going to be set up, to have, a, to have a maximum of about 30 employees working out of, the, out of the site and having one passenger van moving 15 people, if everybody drove a car, specifically one car per, per employee that were left over, then that passenger van plus 15 would be the maximum amount of cars that would be on that site. And just knowing from our experience with our operations and our um, employees and how you know, they come and go uh, to and from work that aren't transported to and from work, um, Probably four out of five cars have more than one people, one person in it because people carpool. Okay, so you know. if we made it part of our condition to say none of your employees are allowed to park on Birchwood, would that be part? That would, that be, would that be acceptable or true? Or that, could you hold to that? If if you tell me that we can't park park on Birchwood, I would agree to that absolutely. Okay. There, there is, <coughs> if I may add, there is actually a note on the site, not, not on the <coughs> maneuvering plans, but on the actual site plan. There's a note on there that states that. There will be no on-street parking on Birchwood. And on a given day, I mean, there's there are people parked up and down, you know, that, that we've noticed and stuff. But look, we, I am so confident that we're not gonna we're not gonna need to we're not gonna be blocking traffic. That's fine. Yep. Mr. Kempen, you had a question for staff. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, normally, when we meet, people are erecting buildings, and it becomes an uh, almost irreversible decision. This, you know, parking situation on a paved facility kind of dictates to what we used to do in the ZBA and grant temporary uh, uh, approval. I was wondering if that's something that the Planning Commission would have uh, purview to do, say, like, grant it for one season with evaluation. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, um, you really should be focusing on the property, not the individual uses of this property, not the specific things, the turning radius and the operations of, of this particular applicant. You really should be focusing on the property itself and what it's going to be used for. Um, and the temporary, um, you know, it, it's, it's just not something that um, would be appropriate in, in this situation. Although it is creative, um, again, that's accommodating this particular individual um, and, and not really focusing on um, the, the, the property itself. And also, if I, if I may also, there was a, a comment before inquiring about, um, you know, something saying that you wouldn't be parking on the street. I would discourage you from any condition um, similar to that because it's very difficult to enforce it. And again, it, it really should be self-contained. Um, you know, your, your decision should be focused only on this particular proposal. Thank you. Mr. Sanzica. Well, I just have listened to the petitioner. I think with some redesign, I think you could probably work it out with staff and, you know, with the proper dimensions and with the details that they're asking for. And I wouldn't have any uh, opposition to uh, postponing this until some point in time when you can resubmit the plan with the staff approval to, to move ahead with this. So I, I'm sure you can manage this, and it's just a, a matter of working out the details and uh, being able to present a, a, a plan that's acceptable to our, to our staff. Mr. Tegel? Yes, Mr. Mr. Hudson. I'm not here at the end. Um, there are just too many uncertainties in my mind uh, 
and they've even been increased with the presentation we've had tonight. And I, I think that, uh, I think our city attorney said we can't do a temporary one. I would have voted against that anyway. I, I think that we ought to take the recommendation of our planning consultant and postpone this and have the petitioner resubmit based upon our discussions tonight with a number of vehicles that can fit within that site and do it safely. I appreciate that he's got a time concern, but I'm more concerned with the overall picture of that lot in the city. Mr. Savinet, is parking allowed on Birchwood? I, I believe it's, you can park on one side of it. I think one side sign, no parking, one side is, is you can park, but it's, that's intended for, you know, kind of one-off situations. It's not intended to, to, part, to, to provide off-street parking for a use mm -hmm. on a public street. It's, it's intended in, in, in the city of Troy that 100% of, of the parking demand is provided for on site. Right. So, so if, if, um, if this use or any other use were to provide, you know, regular par you know, parking on the street, they'd be in violation of our ordinance. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, I'm gonna open the public hearing. If you gentlemen would like to take a seat. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to come and speak on this item? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. <coughs> Gentlemen, what's your preference? Mr. Sanzi. I'd like to resolve the special use approval and preliminary site plan approval for the proposed Night Adventures 2 LLC west of John R. north of Maple, 1861 Birchwood, Section 26, currently zoned IB Integrated Industrial and Business District, be postponed to the June 11th, 2000, 2013. Such postponement should provide the applicant time to resubmit a site plan and other associated plans which reduce the proposed number of vehicles to be stored on a site, reducing the number of vehicles will reduce the number of employee off-street parking spaces, provide better site circulation. Super. Second by Mr. Hudson. Discussion? Mr. Evans. If um, <coughs> it sounds like the petitioner is bringing up a, an issue tonight about the 20% landscape, parking lot landscaping, is that something that that uh, the planning was, would that require a, a zoning variance from the from the ZBA? No. And who who would it, who would grant that? Would the can the planning commission grant? That? The way that um, the way that we uh, administer the ordinance in terms of this provision is is it's it ex, it's an existing nonconformity, and as long as they do not increase the, that particular nonconformity, they can continue. Um, so we, we, we don't require that they jackhammer asphalt to, I think Mr. Carlisle's reporting, he's, he's obligated to apply the zoning ordinance, all provisions of the zoning ordinance, and that's what he did. Um, but uh, the, main, the main landscaping concerns with this site are to provide landscape trees, which th there's none now, and they're providing two. Right. Thank you. Could I just get a clarification? Is June 11th the next? Date. I'm fairly certain it is. Okay. I had, I had written the 13th for one of the items, and I just want to make sure that. Yes, sir. It is the 11th. Okay. Thank Second you. Tuesday is the 11th of June. Thank you. All right. Are we ready for a vote? Anthony? Mr. Sanzi, yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Stratt? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Kempen? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Thank you. Can All I, right. Can I make one comment on that? Before Certainly, we, Mr. Schultz. Um, the, the discussion we had about parking, I think we would be on a slippery slope, even though all parking is to be contained on the property. I think we'd be on a slippery slope telling any property owner that they cannot have anyone park on a public street. Parking on public streets is allowed. And I, th I think we'd be overstepping our bounds if we ever did that. Thank you. All right, special use requests and preliminary site plan review. Item number seven, it's a public hearing. Special use and preliminary site plan review file number SU407. Proposed 1800 mini storage east side of Rochester, south of Waddles, 3846 Rochester, 
Section 23, currently zone GB, general business district. Mr. Carlisle. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, before the Planning Commission tonight is a site plan and special use approval for a self-storage facility located at thir um, sorry, 3846 Rochester Road. The property is currently zoned general business, um, which does permit self-storage uses as a special use. Um, this stretch of Rochester Road between Big Beaver and Waddles is zoned general business. This is the largest stretch of general business uh, zone property um, in the city. Um, and of the two city biz zoned uh, business districts, um, the GB and the CB, the GB is the more intense business district. And the GB, when was, this was created with the um, change in the zoning ordinance a few years ago, was intended to provide a diversified mix of commercial and service uses um, at, at a larger scale, at a citywide scale and at a regional scale. The CB, on the other hand, was intended really for smaller scale retail uses to, survive, to serve the surrounding area. So this was a commercial uses for a much larger regional area. Um, furthermore, the GB was intended to be located along major arterials such as Rochester Road. Um, the fundamental question tonight in front of us um, is in regards to the self-storage is really a question of bulk height density um, and potential impact upon adjacent properties. Um, looking at the use itself, um, self-storages um, really are a, a, a less intense use than some other uses that could be permitted by right. Um, office building, um, some sort of restaurant use, some sort of um, uh, multifamily residential um, use. But the question is the issue of the bulk and scale and the five-story height that the applicant has proposed. Um, in regards to standards, the proposed development does meet all the bulk requirements in the GB zoning district. Um, it is located 30 feet from Rochester Road. Um, it is 73 feet from the rear property line. That's in excess of 40 feet uh, plus than what's required by the ordinance. Um, the building is five stories in, in height, 69 feet in total. Um, that again is permitted under the GB district. You can have 75 feet in height. Um, but it's worth noting a couple items when the Planning Commission does consider the impact of this development in the special use standards. Um, this site does back up to single family residential. However, all um, GB uh, zone properties along this stretch of Rochester Road and most of the GB zone property in the city all do back up to single family residential. Um, so I'm gonna ask the Planning Commission to kind of rack their brain about when the GB was established and what the reasoning behind including such, um, such bulk standards um, were, were put in place. Um, is our, is our recollection that the GB really was, was devised, um, especially along this, this stretch of Rochester Road, um, to permit greater flexibility in, in commercial development, to permit more increased density and increased development to really spur um, some commercial activity along Rochester Road. Um, but that being said, this is a special use, and the special use uh, has to be considered in adjacent and consistent with adjacent properties, compatibility, the master plan recommendation, um, as well as secondary impacts on surrounding property. Um, the applicant, um, we feel the applicant has done a number of steps to mitigate impact on adjacent properties. They've moved the building farther back from the rear property line. Um, they've, uh, they have um, agreed to, to uh, preserve a, a 10 foot wide landscape buff from the rear of the property that includes a number of mature uh, 40 foot tall uh, maple trees. Uh, they are included to, to uh, install an eight foot high concrete uh, brick wall in the rear of the site. Um, they placed all the parking at the side of the building and all activities um, except for a few side loaded access uh, units are gonna be accessible from interior of the site. There's gonna be no operations in the rear of the site other than vehicles turned around to enter the facility through the, through the drawers. I'm sorry, through the doors. Um, all that being said, we do find that there are some additional opportunities that the applicant can, can, can make to mitigate um, potential impacts on neighbors. When I talk about potential impacts, I'm talking about um, impacts of noise, sight lines, height, shadowing, odor, uh, hours of operation, et cetera. Um, one of these is, again, to make sure that they preserve that existing tree buffer. This tree buffer, from looking at, these, these trees were planted somewhat on center, so it appears that they were actually put in place in order to uh, provide screening to the adjacent uh, single family residential properties. Um, if necessary, once that kind of gets cleaned out a little bit, um, the applicant will also be asked to uh, supplement that with some, some evergreen trees as well, because um, there's opportunities to increase the screening back there as well. 
Um, the applicant has shown building lighting on their, their east elevation, which uh, is adjacent to the residential. We've asked that they remove all building lighting in that location, and there is required building lighting in the rear of the site. These should be done on poles that are at the rear of the site shooting back inwards to the site, so there will not be any light spill over uh, to the adjacent residential. Um, the east elevation does have some windows. We've asked that those windows all be frosted so that people in the facility cannot look through those windows into the adjacent single family properties. Um, there is a door that's intended for activity inside the building. We, uh, condition of approval should be that door should be closed at all times outside <coughs> of uh, vehicles entering the facility themselves. And um, the use should be limited to self storage only and should not be rented out for private events or private functions. In regards to standards, there are a number of standards for self storage. These are listed in 6.24. These include um, incidental sales, uh, storage of materials, uh, material use and the storage of recreational ve recreational vehicles and outdoor storage. The applicant does meet all those required standards. Um, since it's a special use, it has to be reviewed under section 9.03, and this includes compatibility with adjacent uses, compatibility with the master plan, traffic impact, impact on public services, um, compliance with the building ordinance, as well as secondary impacts on adjacent properties. As noted, outside of height, height and, and bulk, the use really has um, a less of an impact that would be allowed of, of a by right development. So the question for the Planning Commission tonight really is, is this use compatible with the adjacent properties adjacent on Rochester Road, and has the applicant done enough from a rational relationship standpoint to mitigate the potential impacts on the adjacent properties? That concludes my report, and if open for any questions from the Planning Commission. Any questions for Mr. Carlo? Yes, sir. Mr. Carlisle, you talked about a 10-foot landscape buffer at the rear of the property. You're talking about the one that runs along the north edge of the property? No, the, the site plan that's submitted does not show that landscape buffer. In conversation with the applicant, we've requested that they, they, um, they uh, revise the site plan to show that 10-foot 10, 10 landscape buffer, and the applicant felt that they could do that. Okay, thank you for the clarification, because I'm looking at the drawing and I'm going, I don't see the landscaping he's talking it's about. not on the site plan that was submitted for review. <clears throat> Anything else for Mr. Carlisle? Just a comment for those in the audience. We received correspondence uh, via email from a Mr. Robertson and a Mr. Flagg, and there's also a um, petition that was circulated, um, a copy of which was emailed to you earlier, and you've got a hard copy in front of you. Thank you. All right, is petitioner present? Please come forward. start. Um, good evening. My name is Joseph Guido, Guido Architects, uh, 23419 Ford Road in Dearborn, and I'm the project architect. Uh, most of this is my work, so um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I, uh, I don't see that there's any problem with anything that, uh, that Ben has suggested. Uh, the tree issue at the rear of the property kind of came at the last minute. It was, it was after we had submitted our formal site plan uh, submittal and it was discussed and Mr. Hirsch uh, feels that uh, there isn't any real issue with doing that. We can adjust uh, some of our landscaping and rebalance it. We do provide, uh, I think we meet uh, every requirement of the ordinance uh, other than this be requiring special use. Our setbacks are proper, our landscaping is proper. Um, it is a quiet use. You're probably familiar with Mr. Hirsch's other property on Maple Road east of Coolidge. Uh, you probably understand that they run a first class operation there. This would be their second facility in Troy. Uh, they've done, been very successful on Maple Road, uh, so they'd like to retain another facility in the city. Um, we have no problem with eliminating the windows altogether on the rear. We don't need to frost them. If they're really in a stairwell. Uh, those can be eliminated totally. So we've kept all our activity to the north and south <coughs> sides of the site. The only activity on the uh, east side would be the, the, the cars that enter the building, all the loading and unloading except for 16 outside spaces on the north and south. Uh, everything would be done within the building, uh, not outside. So, and again, just the nature of the business, it's a very quiet use in terms of traffic. A facility this size, which is about just under 800 units uh, internally, would probably generate no more than about 20 trips per day 
which would be much less intense than, uh, than an office use or some other use. It's a, it's a relatively quiet use after initial lease up of the facility. Uh, we've kind of patterned it architecturally uh, uh, on the other one, it's on Maple Road. We wanted to have a consistent look to it. So what you see there is pretty much what you get here. The only difference is uh, that's three stories, this would be five. We're actually about uh, five feet under the allowable height. That's all we really need. So I think we're 69 to 70 feet right in there where it's uh, allowed to be 75, I believe, by ordinance. So we've tried to uh, work in the spirit of the ordinance. Um, I think ultimately, certainly whenever you develop something of this size, there's gonna be an impact on, on the surrounding area. But we think in this case, uh, because of the nature of the use, uh, it's, it's gonna be a very compatible use uh, ultimately with the surrounding area. So, and we have worked closely with, uh, with Brent and Ben and the traffic engineer uh, to come up with a circulation pattern that works with this situation. We are restricted uh, north and south with two existing approaches, so we've had to work around that. But I think we've come up with a, a plan that, uh, that works well. And again, you have to realize that uh, uh, there would be virtually you know, 10 to 20 cars a day utilizing this site. Historically, that's what we've seen with a project of this size. So anything else? I'd be more than happy to answer any other questions. Any questions? Yeah. Stratza. Yes, sir. Mr. Guido, you have faithfully complied with the ordinance as uh, the general ordinance, but as our planning consultant indicated, a special use, we take into consideration the impact on the neighborhood. And looking at Rochester Road, this is going to be the only five-story building to date and in the past in that area, which it does abut residential and all GB does. So everybody who has a home there knows at some point in their life, if they haven't uh, seen the development on the other side of the lot line, there's going to be retail or some sort of establishment like that. But five stories is tall. And if you reduced it by one story, would that seriously impact the whole project? Well, we've kind of run some numbers, and there's a, a critical mass that we need to support the costs involved in, in the development. Uh, the, the property is relatively expensive, being Rochester Road frontage. Uh, we've kind of worked backwards to try to determine what kind of net rentable square footage we need to, to support the project economically. Uh, so that's where we develop. The, it's about 118,000 square feet, which is smaller than Maple Road. Um, although we, we were able to spread out more on Maple Road because we had a larger site, so we, and we, which is what we would probably do here if the site was a little bit larger, we probably would, would spread it out a little, little more in the footprint. So other than an economic uh, driver, um, that's where that fifth story is important. If we lost a story, we'd lose about uh, 20,000 feet, and I'm not sure economically if that would uh, allow the project to go forward. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Uh, what if you did a step back? In other words, four stories and a step back, and then the fifth story, is there a, would that, let's say you, you lost maybe 20% of that fifth floor, would that seriously impact uh, your ability to construct this building or not? I'm just looking at the shadow it, it casts on the neighbors. I'm trying to find a... <clears throat> we, uh, we did a little shadow study. Uh, I saw. Right. Yeah. Nicely and, uh, done. Thank you. Appreciate that. I, I try my best. It, it's a little misleading because the shadow intensity as it leaves the building because of the software is the same. And typically as it as it gets, you know, 70 to 100 feet away, it dissipates somewhat. So it's it's a little misleading. And there, and there would be in a certain time, very limited time, there would be some shadow cast on the building. In this case, with the amount of tree cover that's there now, and there's some large evergreens in the backyard, we don't think that that would substantially impact the neighbors as to what's already there in terms of tree cover. And if we uh, leave the trees that are there, which uh, Mr. Hirsch has agreed to do, I think that would certainly help mitigate that problem. But your point is well taken. We, we could potentially look at stepping back the fifth story, a certain point to soften that, that impact. Um, I, I can't tell you standing up here today how much we could reduce it to where it would make sense, but we'd certainly be willing to look at that. And you mentioned the trees, let me follow up on that. You mentioned the trees. The existing trees there, did you do a, could you include in 
at some further point to show what the shadows the neighbors presently have on their homes? Well, or not? I think in in the summertime, from now till winter, uh, they're totally in shadow. I mean, every tree on there is casting. They're much larger than the house is, even in the front. If uh, I think Ed, you had some pictures of that, but it's pretty dense. So, so I'm not say? sure that we're going to add significantly to that at all. Okay, so then I understand what you're saying is that the shadow cast by your building won't be any more than the existing shadow already produced by the trees. That's my belief, yes, sir. Okay. Much now in the winter when there's no leaves on the tree, there's still evergreens in the, uh, yeah, this is kind of a, I'm sure you've all been out there to look at it, but that's kind of a, here, let me put this. That's what you, I think it was taken today or yesterday? Yesterday. So the leaves aren't totally out yet, but you can see that's pretty dense. You don't even know there's a house there, to be honest. So I don't really think that any shadow that would be cast by this building would add significantly to the shadow that's already in, you know, in the backyard of the house. A little follow up, Mr. Tagle? Yes. Uh, in the wintertime, the sun's at a much more southerly. <clears throat> in other words, the shadow, it, it doesn't really set in the west. This is, it does set in the west, but it doesn't set as far north right. in the west. So again, uh, maybe you could show in your shadow study that there's very little or no, no impact on those homes. I think it, we did we did that okay. on, at the winter solstice, the 21st. Okay. It, it really, yes. the shadows cast to the north. Correct. You're exactly okay. right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Edmonds. Uh, I have two questions. One, uh, is there elevators in this building? I didn't see them. Yes. Oh, okay. Two. Okay. Thanks. And the second question is, uh, when I was out there yesterday, those large maple trees in the back, there's, there's probably three of them that are in really good shape and are viable. There's at least two of them that are growing right into the concrete wall. And it looks like they might have even been planted on the neighbors on the resident side. So I don't, one of those branches, a huge branch, goes right out over the parking area here. So I'm sure that's going to have to be trimmed down. Yeah, there'll be some, some trimming down. Right. And I didn't know if you're willing to replace a couple of those large maple trees if they uh, if they should have to come down. I think it probably would make the most sense is to, to do some supplemental evergreen planting in that strip. And then there's some protection uh, all year round, which I, I think you'd be willing to do. Yeah. Once you lose a big tree, though, you know, can't replace it immediately. Right. Yeah, it takes time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Carlo. If, if the, the preservation of those trees in the rear are the direction the Planning Commission wants to go as part of the special use approval, we would require the applicant to submit a tree preservation plan to ensure that those trees actually can be preserved during the construction period. Thank you. What, what size vehicles, what's the largest vehicles that will drive through the building? Uh, this one can't uh, accommodate semi-traffic, so there, there would be no semi-traffic in this one. About a 30-foot box truck would be the largest. And the radiuses, they don't show real well on that plan, but the radiuses coming in and around are based on a 30-foot box truck, which would be about the largest vehicle that would uh, utilize the site. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. well, if there's no other questions or comments, we'll uh, ask you gentlemen to sit down. We'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to this item? <clears throat> My name is Bob Flagg. I live at 1219 Judy, which is behind this, not directly behind it, but I have sight lines to it. Um, I've heard a lot about the shadows and all that, but I think what concerns me the most is um, I can recall, and I could go back and get the archives of the Troy Times, but when you were fighting Hooters over the location there on Rochester Road, I recall spending thousands of dollars in legal fees, and the argument was at that time in the paper that you wanted to create the new boulevard with Rochester to have it more of a, a uh, more like downtown Rochester, for example. And that's great. That's what the residents wanted. And I think you've done some of that. I think up by Nino's where there's new development is up there. This, and I have nothing against the developer, but this is not where this thing belongs if you want to have Rochester look like a boulevard. I mean, this is a five-story, you know, monstrosity 
in the middle of a street that's got nothing but one or two stories on it. So yeah, it's gonna, you know, it affects the homes, but it also, if you wanna have a nice looking Rochester road, this isn't part of it. So, you know, I think you guys should think if you're a planning commission, what is your plan? I don't see this as part of your plan if that was your plan when you were fighting Hooters. So. Thank you, I, and I don't think it was the planning commission that was fighting Hooters. Uh, well, that was, I remember the arguments. I could go back and pull them out of the paper. It said, you know, we want more of a, a people-friendly Rochester Road. I don't see it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my name is George Pearl. I live in Troy for 30 years. Um, I'm just going to say something about 1-800 Mini Storage. It's a wonderful facility. I think it's a good idea for the city. I use them. I'm amazed at how many business people I've come in contact with that have come from other places to use this facility. I'm sure you've seen it. Mm -hmm. It's user-friendly, it's well-maintained, it's clean, and I think it's good for business. I like this city. I think business is always needed, and I think this facility would be good for the city. I appreciate what this gentleman just said. I understand it, but as a person who uses this facility, on a daily basis, it's just outstanding. I have no horse in this race, okay? Other than to tell you what I'm thinking. I think it's a hell of a good idea. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Leaf, please. please. Sir? Pardon me? Uh, your comment, you have no horse in this race? No. You have no financial interest in 1-800 no, mini storage? No. Okay, I just wanted Absolutely to Absolutely not. Absolutely clear. Absolutely Thank not. You. I'm just one of their customers and okay. happy to be so. Mr. Tagle, did he sign in? I don't know. Sir, did you sign the uh, sign-in sheet? Would you mind? Will you sign in? Thank you. Yeah, but I will be for a leave of that. Go ahead. Sign it. You can sign it right now. Thank you. Anyone else? Please come forward. I'd like to address the Planning Commission. Thank you for letting me speak. My name's Kimberly Flagg. I'm the wife of Bob Flagg, who just spoke. My biggest concern in the city is we have a lot of strip malls. We have a lot of vacant buildings that have been vacant for years. And I think the facility would be okay but I don't see why they can't put him in contact with some other property owners where the buildings have been vacant, their eyesores, and um, they're large enough where he could have the five-story, more appropriate, and wouldn't back up to any residential areas. One of the areas would be Sims. Sims has been there empty, I can't tell you how long. Um, these would be more, you know, more commercial, appropriate areas. 15 and Levernoy, Kmart store, how big is that? That's been sitting vacant for years. Give the developer a tax incentive, put him in contact with the property owner and let him renovate it with no problem with five stories. There's no um, homes backing up there. Uh, you have Kmart Corporation. That's three stories. That's 16 in Coolidge. That's huge. That's where these facilities need to be, not near, um, sub, not near subdivisions. Everything on Rochester Road is like one story, two story, not five story, not four story. Um, I'm sure. If you live there, you wouldn't want this monstrosity in your backyard. Think about it a little bit. We pay high taxes. We should have a right um, to, we have, and the rest of Rochester Road's nice. Why would you allow a five-story or four-story monstrosity? I really think you should take that under advisement. We have so many eyesores around this city. I'm sure he could renovate one of those. Thank you for listening. Do you mind signing in, ma'am? 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 I'm sorry.
Thank you. Thank you. I'm Krishna Chalmila. I just live exactly behind that uh, empty space. You know, like, uh, I have a similar questions like Mr. Crent has, like, you know, shadow. I know these guys are saying, like, uh, we did study actually with the trees. You don't see any sunlight. But I don't agree with that. I live there. I just bought the house, like, a year back, right, hoping that empty space, some shopping mall or something like that, which, which is not, like, maybe five store, maybe two stores. Even three stores I'm worried about, actually. So uh, if with the five store, I'm sure I'm going to lose all the lighting in my house, right? So like, I'm really like, I, I don't want like five store, actually. Just I would make it clear, actually. So that's thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you for giving me opportunity. Yeah. I'm uh, Dave Hummy, and we also live directly behind the building. As you can see on the chart, uh, there's a driveway where they go in the back that comes directly against the fence. When I inquired about that, they said they need that for the trucks to be able to turn in. And I don't see any room for any trees, the great <coughs> shade trees that they showed there, if the driveway comes right up to the fence. I believe in the discussions with the planning consultant, the planning department, they've agreed to pull the driveway so the trees can remain there. Oh. And that does not is not shown on yeah. the drawings. That I, you I have at. a hard time hearing back there. Oh, it's so sure. it's so quiet. And also the shade factor. We have no grass in our backyard. We have a lovely brick patio and nothing but flowers back there. I'm afraid without any sunshine, those flowers are going to be sadly uh, dead. And again, uh, we've talked to many of the neighbors, as you uh, folks see on that petition that was circulated, and uh, they are also, you know, not not for it. I, I believe you have 33 names there, but a lot of others, you know, weren't home and so forth. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Haruko Terada. I actually don't live very close, but I use the uh, Rochester Road very often. And I always have difficulty going through uh, right before Waddles from Rochester Road to, uh, to Waddles. So I'm kind of concerned that how many trucks are there gonna be, depending on uh, how, many, how many storage rooms, 800? Because the, uh, the truck usually takes a little bit time to get out and to get in. and I'm concerned about the traffic, especially on uh, nighttime. Usually from uh, Rochester to Waddles is really the time that, that's kind of a busy, busy time. And so uh, even though I don't use it very often, I, that time right now, but I'm also concerned because uh, my son goes to IEA, so International Academy East. So I use that road very often in the morning as well. What happens if the truck is trying to make a turn in and turning out? and uh, that's kind of my concern. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this item? Uh, Mark Desidos, I live at 3819 Hawthorne, which would be where that garbage can would be. And um, that's one of the concerns I have is 
a couple of the other businesses, they get their garbage picked up pretty early, about 7 a.m. Thursday morning, 7 a.m., I'm getting woken up by slamming garbage cans. That's gonna be even closer. That's a concern of mine. In general, I just moved in there about two years ago, so it's been vacant, so you know, you get used to the vacant vacancy, but um, it's not gonna fit in there. I originally, I like the idea, I'm not opposed to the idea, but five stories is way too big. It's, it has to be, you know, you mentioned four stories, I even think that would be too big. I would say three, but um, that's basically my concern, is it just would not fit in with the, um, with the aesthetics of the area. And you also mentioned the tree height. I look at those trees every day, and I think five stories is higher than those trees. I really do. And um, that's something you guys aren't going to realize until you actually put that monstrosity up. And I'm worried that that's all I'm going to see. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward? All right, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission for discussion. Mr. Crint. I just want to address the last speaker's uh, concern about <clears throat> the five-story being visible from his, uh, even the front of his property. Uh, maybe we could, well, what I'd like to see is maybe a, uh, some kind of diagram showing that the height of those trees will preclude any visibility of that building, even if it was five stories, from uh, anywhere on those budding property, residential properties. It's, I'd like to see that if possible. <clears throat> Brent, do we have any idea how mature, how high those trees are? And are they all deciduous trees? Are there evergreens? The the trees that are that we're talking about, I believe, are maples. Okay. So they're deciduous. So they would, I'll state the obvious. Yeah. They'll lose their leaves in the right. fall, and they'll come back again in about this time. Um, I don't know exactly what they are. I stood out there. I would say between 40 and 50 feet would be my guess, but um, that's just an act. That's just a, a guess on my part. Okay, thank you, Mr. Edmonds. Can someone explain to me the shadow effect? And, and uh, I'm not familiar with this software that does that. Are these neighbors going to experience shadow from that building? From the from the the roof of that building on down to their property at any point. The, uh, I'm not an architect, so I'll let the architect <clears throat> explain how the shadow effect works. Um, what I can tell you though is that, that based on the shadow diagram shown to us by the, um, the applicant, during the, the summer solstice, which would be the most intense shadowing effect, um, if, if there were no trees in the back, if there were no trees in screening, then yes, the building would impact and, and throw shadows onto the um, single family residential uh, uh, adjacent. However, as indicated by the applicant, um, there are these mature trees that already um, provide shading and shadowing. Um, so um, how accurate the shadow study is based without the existing trees on there might not be a, an accurate reflection of the actual shadow pattern. That, that's going to proceed. But yes, I mean, the, the five-story building will throw shadows on the adjacent properties. Thank you. Mr. Strat, you had a comment? Oh, was that what you're done, Mr. Edmonds? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Strat? You know, I just wanted to uh, make a point that these trees are, I think you said 40 feet in height. Uh, is that correct? I think that's being, conser I think that's being conservative, but I could but be wrong. They're, they're, they're premature trees. I mean, they're, they're anywhere from 15 to 20 inches in gallon. And the structure itself, I think they compromised and they pushed it back to 75 feet? It's 70, I think it's 73 feet. Uh, 75, 75, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, at any rate, if you're standing in a backyard or even in a house and you're blocking the view, you're looking up at the top of that, it's gonna be close to impossible to see the five story at 73 feet, or how high is it, 72 feet high? Uh, I think it's gonna be rather difficult for them to really see the, the actual uh, five story from the back of their homes or in their homes. Unless they're out in the street, they may be able to see it in the front. But from that point, uh, I don't see that having a big impact. The other thing is, as you pointed out, Mr. Carlisle, uh, the shadows in the wintertime, we, 
unfortunately, we don't get that much sun <laughs> in the wintertime. But uh, during the summer, of course, uh, that's when you have the highest intense, but that's when the sun is actually at the highest point and uh, the shadows that are casted are not long ca uh, casting shadows at that point, except late in the evenings. But I just wanted to make the point that I think that it really is, I mean, you did say that they did compromise and they did push the building back from the front. Is that correct? Yeah, they, um, under the GB zoning district, they can go up to, I believe the rear setback is 30 feet from the rear property line. So they're, they're adding an additional 45 feet of Right. Official setback. Right. And that was through your uh, negotiating with them, is that correct? I was, it was not a negotiation, but it was in discussions that we've had with the applicant. <laughs> yeah. um, our recommendation was to move it as close to Rochester Road as possible. Yeah, I, I see that. I think that you did an excellent job in doing that. I have to commend the staff. But I, I do think that uh, it could be, according to our zoning ordinance, an office building could be there at five stories, is that correct? Office is a permitted use uh, in the GB district. Right, which would mean that there would be all windows all across the backside, whereas this, the, they volunteered to actually block that off, and you're commenting that that one glass window would be frosted or could be eliminated. Is that they, correct? Uh, there's a number of windows that were shown in that stairwell on, the, on that rear elevation, but they have indicated that they're willing to remove those um, windows altogether. Yeah, I think that would be desirable if they removed it entirely and just... Uh, blocked it all the way up. That way there's no glass, no windows on the back side of the, uh, the unit, is that correct? There's no windows on the back side. Um, they did show light wall packs on the back side, which we've recommended that they actually take off and uh, put on the rear of the property and shoot inwards towards their property so that there would be no light spill off. Even if wall packs are fully shielded, there's still a little bit of glow that would be visible from the adjacent residence. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Chairman? Yes, Mr. Schultz. I personally like to postpone this to the next meeting so that we can get an accurate site plan drawing, in including the landscaping that's being proposed and the new radius on the rear driveway. Um, I agree with what's been said. If there are 40 or, higher or taller trees along the property lines, the residents aren't even gonna be able to see this building. Well, I, and I agree with that uh, for a, a different reason. What I'd like to see is really what is the impact going to be on the street side? Um, I'd like to see if you could take some photographs and superimpose this, even if it was just a mass uh, on, on the, in the photographs to see really what, what is that going to look like? Well, I, I guess I'm not so concerned. I mean, I, I know the Maple Road project. It's a very nice looking project, but I'm just trying to put this in context with, with the street side, with, with the buildings adjacent to it um, and where they sit in their height. Yeah, would you come up forward, please? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, we do we do show the uh, the building to the north, which is a, a I think it's a computer store or office that's a converted house. So that's one story, and that's probably 40 feet or more closer to Rochester Road than we would be uh, with our first story. We did we do come out with the second story, so we're actually driving in in order under the building to have the maneuvering. Uh, distance that we need to be able to access the site properly. That came as a result really of uh, some site constraints with the two driveways, not so much the one to the north, but the one to the south, I mean to the south, but the one to the north is actually encroaching about six to seven feet onto the property. And at this point, they haven't, hasn't been willing to work with uh, Mr. Hirsch to remedy that situation. So we, we've had to kind of alter things to work around that encroachment, uh, sensing that it might be tied up for a long time in court at best if, uh, if that activity is taken. So we, we did have, in the original site plan, we had the driveway coming out on the north side. 
and we were willing to grant an access easement to the property to the north to get to his parking lot in our driveway. It was a much cleaner mm -hmm. circulation pattern, but uh, as of now, he's not, not very willing to cooperate. So we had to, in order to close on the property, we had to come up with a site plan that would be acceptable right. uh, at this point, given, given the situation. Would you be willing, if, if this was postponed, would you be willing to come back and give us a little bit better idea of the context of this building as you're looking up and down Rochester Road on the east side? I think so. Okay. I, I think there's a problem with, with closing though, right? Yeah, there's, there's a, pro, the property needs to close pretty soon. He's already gotten an extension. So, if ahead. I may, I'm Jerry Pesek, 380 North uh, Old Woodward, Birmingham. I'm the attorney for the property owner. Um, there is an agreement in place with the seller that will expire before your next meeting. Um, and we don't, at this point, know that there's a possibility of extending that agreement. So that potentially creates a problem in terms of um, putting it over to the next meeting. We're certainly happy to try and today address any concerns and answer any additional questions. But there is a certain level of unpredictability in terms of the project going forward um, if we are postponed. When is the uh, expiration? <laughs> it was, it's already been extended a number, a number of times in order to get to this point and working with the planning consultant and getting everything approved from that perspective. So we didn't, we didn't end up with this timing intentionally. It just kind of happened this way and there was an additional extension obtained in order to like make this meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, that puts us all in a challenging situation, doesn't it? It does, and I and I appreciate that. And, and we, but we certainly want to attempt to address <clears throat> yeah, I think every concern of, that that's on the table. I, I think, I, you know, and again, not speaking for my fellow commissioners, but I think what some of us are looking for is really a, a little bit more uh, information, not verbally presented, but graphically or pictorially presented, so that we could better understand what this five-story building is going to look like in the context of the neighborhood. And that's, that's, I mean, we've seen the renderings and we've seen the drawings, but, you know, they're, they're somewhat out of context. And so it's, it's something, at least speaking for myself, I'd like to see a little bit more uh, of what that contextual impact will be. And unfortunately, a day is not enough. We're certainly happy to go back and try and provide whatever information we can. It all becomes moot if the purchase right. agreement expires is, is the problem. Right. And uh, I'm not trying to force yeah. the board, obviously, into a decision that it prefers not to make tonight, but there's just this practical problem sitting out there. It's the pink elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know how to address that other than to tell you the problem exists. And, you know, it's we're happy to provide anything. We certainly, I think Mr. Carlisle would indicate that we've given him everything. Um, that it had been asked for along right. the way in the right. process. And I'm, I don't want to diminish the responsibility of the board or the importance of the board's questions, but that's the situation we find right. ourselves in tonight. All right, thank you. Gentlemen, Mr. Strat. Yeah, I, just looking at the recommendation of staff, and staff is recommending the preliminary site plan approval based on their findings. And I'm looking at that, and I know that they've got several items that they are also asking that uh, it be considered as a part of their recommendation. I, uh, I certainly, speaking for myself, would certainly vote for it at this point in time if a motion were to be placed. Thank you, Mr. I don't know what. Mr. Edmonds, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to ask <clears throat> Mr. Savinet, was there any holdup in our processing of this application when it was received by you or? Was this ready at, at a previous meeting, or could it could have come at a previous meeting? No, I mean, it, it, it fell where it fell. It, there was no holdups. Uh, there was, um, in, 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 well, we, uh, when we were um, working in, with partnership with the, uh, with the applicant to design the site, the, uh, the, the issue of the, um, that the, uh, the architect indicated the issue of access uh, as related to the property to the north, came up and they shifted the, the drive, but it, I mean, it, that's fairly common to, for, uh, for site plan applications or these type of things that come up during the review. So, I mean, it, 
flowed. I could address Mr. Edmonds' question just briefly about the holdup, and, and there was no intentional holdup, but I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, we were supposed to be on for the last meeting, and there was an administrative issue, and somehow we didn't get on for that last meeting. Yeah, it, there was insofar as we didn't advertise, but uh, as it turns out, it would have been, it, it's a moot point because of the fact that the design changed. The, the location of the of the curb cut sh shifted over, so it was it was it was kind of a moot point. Mr. Hudson, I appreciate Mr. Pesix and his client's dilemma. However, I'm looking at a proposed resolution and recommendation from our planning consultant, and I note there is nothing in there regarding moving that building back 30 feet, and that's what we've got a site plan for. And I feel uncomfortable approving anything without seeing all these revisions we've been talking about because the site plan is going to be our contract. And uh, I'm just hesitant uh, of doing that. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Schultz. Uh, only having about a dozen years on the Planning Commission, <laughs> it's always been, we've always been told that what we approve when we approve a site plan is the drawing that is before us. And the drawing before us tonight does not reflect what we're approving. And I have always been an advocate that I don't support resolutions that have seven, eight, or 10, or 12 caveats in them. They need to be addressed before the site plan is approved. Um, I also, though I'm not an expert, I doubt that there's a whole big line of people standing in line to buy this piece of property that's been vacant for the last four or five or six years. So uh, I think, you know, I think that though it's the, it, is, it is definitely a gate for the, the petitioner, I think it's kind of an arm twist saying it has to be done tonight because our agreement expires tomorrow. I can't vote for this until I see a site plan that reflects everything that's on this list and everything that's been verbalized tonight. All right, any other comments, discussion? Well, I, I see, I mean, <coughs> our staff prepared this resolution and I agree with it, what he says in it and uh, what's been prepared. And these aren't major revisions, uh, you know, at maintaining the 10 foot uh, landscape buffer is, is substantial. That that. I don't think we really need to display on the site plan it's, if it's specifically called out here. Uh, the, the other ones, stu two street trees, you know, reducing the number of lanes that bicycle parking, uh, changing the uh, windows. I mean, the, these are relatively minor things. Uh, I would see no re reason not to uh, bring it forward today for approval. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Krent. Uh, I see the recommendations from our um, planning consultant uh, and about the landscaping, but can we be more specific as far as any trees that are gonna be replaced? We can add that into our resolution because we would like to see some uh, conifers in there, something that would you know, help all year round. Um, y y since it's a special use within a rational relationship, you can put additional conditions, and one of the conditions can be a um, ensure increase, you know, ensure a screening of a certain um, opacity, as well as a tree preservation plan during construction, so we can make sure ensure that those trees can be preserved. Those can be conditions that you can put on um, the application, and 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 if that's the direction of the planning commission, I would advise the applicant to resubmit that information if this is continued to a next meeting, so they can provide us, so we can review it ahead of the meeting, ahead of time for the meeting. I, I didn't catch your last comment. If, if that's the direction the Planning Commission is going in regards to screening in the rear, I would advise the app, they direct the applicant to prepare that prior to next meeting. If it's postponed. If it's postponed, so that we have time to review that and can offer a recommendation um, moving forward. Well, I would think if it's postponed, they would have to comply with all of the items that you've identified plus some of the other comments they've heard here tonight. Yeah, it, they do. I just want to make sure that the applicant has clear direction on where the planning commission is going in terms of um, additional reports, additional graphics, and additional submittal requirements. Thank you. Mr. Stratt. Uh, in addition to the uh, 
setback, roof setback that was increased. Did you say that there was a wall that they are putting up to? There's an existing, I believe it's either a six or eight foot high wall along the, the rear property. They are planning to remove that and um, it, it's in rather disrepair right now. They're planning on removing that and, and replacing it with um, a like six foot masonry wall. I think it'll be six feet, six or eight feet, I don't know. Eight feet eight masonry feet. wall. In addition, um, I know at least one of the properties in the rear has a fence along that wall. So there's a fence and then there's a wall along a, a good portion of that rear property line, if I remember correctly. Thank you. Oh. Well, if there's no other comments, would someone like to make a motion? Mr. Edmonds. I just have another comment. I, you know, I, I understand the concern that, you know, at least three of the neighbors, and I know you have a petition that's signed by 33 people, but, you know, when we all purchase our homes, we they, and they back up to potential commercial usage, uh, you know, I think that's a question of uh, buyer beware situation. And I know you had those. I've I've lived in my <coughs> subdivision for 37 years, and I picked the site that I wanted to be because I wanted it to be on the interior. I didn't want to be on the outside. So, uh, I. I think this is a really good use of this site in terms of the use because it's very uh, non-intense. You know, 20 cars a day, you know, for a huge lot like this is a piece of ground. That's less than you'd get at, at restaurants and, and office buildings. So I, I, w I don't have a problem voting for it like this if we add the other things uh, tonight. But I do understand Mr. Schultz's uh, Point, and I respect that, that we don't have a, a correct uh, uh, blueprint or site plan. Uh, but I don't think it changes very differently from, very much from what we already have. That's my comment. I'll Mr. Tegel? Yes, Mr. Edson. I'd like to uh, move um, if uh, there's no further discussion. Any other discussion? I move we postpone the reconsideration. I move we postpone the consideration of this special use approval and preliminary site plan until the next regularly scheduled meeting of this commission uh, this year. Second. Could we have some discussion on that? If the sure. petitioner wanted to have a special meeting prior to, would you yeah, would I you have a problem have adding no that? Objection to a special meeting. Okay. <coughs> could, should that be added to Mr. the? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Could I suggest that the the resolution might be at the regu next regular meeting or at such time as the planning department and planning consultant have had adequate time to review if, as, if a different date is chosen. Well, if you'd like to rephrase that into <laughs> a motion, I'd certainly support it, Mr. Schultz. I would propose that we postpone this to the June 11th meeting or such date as the petitioner has supplied the necessary information to the planning department and consultant with adequate time for their review, um, and they could call a special meeting if they chose to. I'll support that. Mr. Sanzica. I just, didn't, just a note, I see that we have eight members here tonight, mm -hmm. and will we need a, a majority of five to pass the, uh, the vote? Yes. Thank you. Kathy, the roll call, please. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Strack? No. Mr. Tegel? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Kempton? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Mr. Zanzika? Yes. Hopefully you guys can get a get an extension. And I'd uh, like to see you back here as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> don't forget don't forget your rendering. It's it's on the table right there. All right, our next item of business. 
records. Item number eight is another public hearing, special use and preliminary site plan review, file number SU-406, proposed McDonald's restaurant, west side of DeQuinder, south of Big Beaver, 36895 DeQuinder, section 25, currently zoned NNB, uh, neighborhood node B. Mr. Carlisle? Yes, thank you, good evening again. Um, the application before us is um, an existing McDonald's located at 36895 to Quinder. Um, the applicant is proposing to convert their existing drive-through from a one-lane drive-through to a two-lane drive-through. That is the impetus behind uh, the majority of the site plan. Um, with that, there are other small modifications to the site, and this includes uh, the removal of the play area in the front facade, other facade improvements, a new uh, trash enclosure area, parking lot reconfiguration, pedestrian connections, as well as a patio dining area in front of the existing building. One of the issues that we wrangled with when we saw this site plan was the issue of nonconformity. Um, this site was rezoned to neighborhood node uh, during the update to the zoning ordinance, which brought the property into nonconformity with building setback. A requirement in the neighborhood node is that all buildings have to be 10 feet from the front property line. Um, this application of this building right now, I believe, is, is 75 feet from the property line. Um, with all that being said, it's realistic that the site um, cannot be brought into conformity with the setback unless the site is completely um, redone, demolished and redone. So when, when we have an issue like this, um, what the director and I do is we consider, are they increasing the nonconformity? Are they bringing the, the building to greater compliance with the ordinance? Um, one could argue that since they are removing the front portion of the building from the site, they're actually bringing the building into less conformance with the ordinance. They're actually moving the building farther away from DeQuinter. However, um, in discussions with the applicant and understanding the intent of the neighborhood node, um, we have decided as a compromise, um, we propose that they actually make the patio area um, a more permanent feature of the site, and that brings the building, um, can be interpreted as bringing the building to greater compliance because it really is meeting the intent and spirit of the DeQuinder neighborhood node area. Um, and this should be done as a more an architectural feature. We, we you know the inclusion of landscaping, a knee wall, some permanent permanent seating, some, some permanent permanence to this to this patio area to, to ensure that it meets the, the 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 intent of the node, which is to to create a presence as well as improve pedestrian connections and pedestrian relationship along to Quinder. So we've asked the applicant to 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 provide that information from uh, with uh, for us. Um, the other significant issue in regards to the site plan is the amount of, of landscape area and open space. Um, again, we struggle since this is a non-conforming uh, site, do we require the, the site to come into compliance with, uh, with landscaping? Um, because we found there's enough significant changes to the site plan, including circulation and building, um, we do find that the site should be coming into compliance with landscaping and open space. Um, they require 20% landscape area and 30% open space. Um, they're deficient in both calculations. Um, however, there are opportunities on the site to, to increase the amount of uh, landscape and open space, and this includes re reducing the width of the drive, uh, drive aisles, reducing the width of the sacking space area, um, removing um, excess parking spaces. They're over parking by seven spaces by ordinance, um, as well as, um, uh, and there are other opportunities, especially in the back of the site, to, to uh, decrease the amount of paving. Um, the third issue is in regards to architecture, and specifically the form-based district requirements in the front elevation. Um, the primary entrance uh, to the site is now on the side adjacent to the parking lot. They're going to maintain that moving forward. Um, however, there is a small entrance that they're proposing along the DeQuinter frontage. We note that that really is a, a non-functional entrance for the most part and really is only going to be used uh, for runners to, to bring out food orders for drive-through cars that, are, that have, have pulled over. Um, the intent of the neighborhood node is to really create a presence and entrance along to Quinder. And so because they're taking out this front facade, we really find there's an opportunity to, to increase and provide an entrance off of to Quinder in this location. And specifically, if we're going to count the patio towards the building uh, issue, uh, we want to make sure that there's, a, there's an entrance on the patio so it's actually a usable and functional space. Um, so with those, those three things, um, um, those are the three major issues in regards to site plan. Minor issues um, that we've noted are, are issues of truck maneuver, maneuverability, um, some additional uh, street trees along to Quinder, uh, a photometric plan, rooftop screening, um, and some parking lot screening. 
Uh, the applicant's architect is here tonight to present. I've had conversations with Mr. Martin last week in regards to all these issues. We, we talked uh, over the issues and went over them. Um, I don't want to speak for, for Mr. Martin, but he did agree that he feels that they can meet these conditions. He has to, he had to, was going to speak with McDonald's. Um, but I wanted him to come in front of the Planning Commission tonight to see if there's an ad any additional direction the Planning Commission would have for the applicant moving forward um, with, the, with the idea that he's going to come back at the next meeting, uh, provide all the, the changes to the site plan that we've recommended um, and move forward from there. That concludes my, um, my report and, and open for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carlo. Any questions for Mr. Carlo? Mr. Schultz. Ben, how tall is the, is the wall on the west side of this property? Do we know? I, I don't know. Maybe the architect has it's a... It's showing four lights along the wall. I'm assuming that those are going to be directed so that absolutely no light goes into the residential property's backyards? Yes, um, it, it was my understanding that, Mr. Um, that the applicant was not planning on changing the existing lighting, but since this is a new site plan we've, and, and the ordinance has changed in terms of lighting requirements, we were going to require them to provide a photometric plan. As part of the photometric plan review, we will ensure that they do um, meet the, the ordinance requirements. Because when, when I look at the overhead photo, it appears that the drive lane is not directly against the, the wall at this point, and now we're going to have traffic right tight up against that wall, mm -hmm. um, which is going to have an impact on the residential property. And question for Brent, if I may. Yes, sir. Are both um, this site and the site that we just talked about, are they under this, the uh, reduced lighting between 11 and 7, like we were talking about on a site last week, where the lighting levels are reduced during the late night hours? Is your question, could we do that? No. Does that, does that requirement apply to this site? We have a 7-Eleven going in up the street. They're going to reduce their lighting during the late night hours. Is this site now going to, re because of the amount of re redoing that they're proposing, are they going to be required to reduce their lighting after hours or in late night hours? Yes. As should the 1-800 mini storage have to reduce their lighting during late night hours? It's yeah, it's 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 a significant enough renovation to the site that we consider it essentially a, a new build for for purposes of lighting. So I think it's important that the petitioner understand that the lights are going to have to be toned down between 11 and 7 or whatever the ordinance says. Unless the planning commission grants some relief from that requirement. Any other questions for Mr. Carlisle? Mr. Stratt. I'd like to uh, make a comment. I think all of us have experienced at one time or another driving down a street and having someone coming back at us at night with their headlights, bright lights on, and your eyes are focused on the hot spot, and you can't see anything beyond that because of that. The whole idea behind putting shields on a light is to avoid that. I don't care how much light there is, and I know that at the last meeting we were talking about the drive up for the bank, that it may be 30-foot candles closer to the light source. But to me, I don't care what, uh, what power, what light power there is, if it can be 2,000 as long as it's not in my eyes and it's lighting up the entire background area, that to me adds some ambiance to me. So to me, I, I think that we have to really be qualifying and finding out exactly what we're doing on that level. I, I really have a problem with all of a sudden dimming the lights down. I understand what, you know, your, the point was that you made was you didn't want to have hot spots at night. But to me, it's a safety factor as well. 
and I know it was true at the bank as well. As long as we are shielding that light source, I don't care what the light level is. To me, it doesn't make any difference, and as long as it's not spilling onto the adjacent property as well. I mean, that's the important thing of having the photos uh, so that we know exactly wh where the lights are going. But hot spots don't bother me at all. That's my opinion. Thank you. Questions, comments? Does the petitioner like to step forward? Good evening. Hi, how are you? My name is, <clears throat> my name is Frank Martin from Dorch and Martin Associates uh, Architects. Uh, we have been involved with McDonald's uh, for 25 or 30 years, and I've been before you not for the last one, which is on uh, Rochester and corporate, big, uh, Rochester and Big Beaver, yes, but not the recent one, the corporate store. I was involved with the uh, renovation to the store that's on Rochester south of Long Lake on the west side when they refurbished the exterior. Um, we have had uh, discussions with uh, Ben Carlisle. After he had written the report, we've talked, and I think he reviewed most of the uh, items that uh, he is suggesting, and I think we can accommodate most of those items. There, there are a couple of, couple of issues. Um, the store is probably 25 years old, maybe 30, um, was built according to the zoning ordinance at the time, uh, permitted, play place was added. Um, several years ago, you changed your ordinance. This became part of a neighborhood node, uh, bringing the buildings up closer to the street. As he says, we're about 75, 80 feet from the street. Um, the dominant customer base at McDonald's, as we all know, is uh, the drive-through. The drive-through is 70 to 75 percent of McDonald's business. Um, the play place in this particular case, the owner-operator has decided that the play place is not functioning in the way it should and that it would be better that it not be there. And with some of the renderings that you saw of what we we're doing, we think it's a very refreshing change to the building, uh, which is a part of this double drive-through that we're requesting also. Um, I think the, uh, the understanding of trying to provide some permanence to the outdoor patio seating that's out there, we actually drew up a site plan that uh, I'm not gonna give you today, but it is going to reflect some uh, two foot square brick piers that match the building with some uh, decorative uh, fencing between uh, that would not totally encompass the play, the outdoor uh, seating area, but do a little return along the, uh, the street and then another little return. Uh, have some permanent seating out there. We still wanna have transparency through the, through the fence. We're gonna adjust our uh, landscaping so that we have appropriate landscaping in front of that. Um, I think the issue came up regarding uh, the amount of landscaping and some excess cars that we might have. We essentially did a calculation. We eliminated uh, five cars at the northeast corner of the site. And the one car that you see right there that says number one for existing next to the drive-through lane, the exiting lane, that will be eliminated and uh, special orders will just be presented to people as they just stack there because it's wide enough for people to stack there. In so doing, uh, the percentage of landscaping went up from 12% that might have been on the calculation to 17%, um, which is significant and very close to the 20% of your requirement. Um, with regards to uh, the lighting, uh, I think um, Mr. Schultz had asked about the lighting uh, and the wall in the back. The wall in the back is eight feet tall, and the lighting that's shown back there is actually wall packs that are mounted at about six feet height, so there's no light that's being directed to the outside. All the lights are horizontal. They're not tipped. They're lights that were there since the building was constructed. Um, the one, the one concern I have, and so does the McDonald's operator, is the addition of a door at the front of the building in order to encourage this neighborhood uh, 
zoning requirement. And I can understand if my building were 10 feet away from a property line, as it would be if I were starting new, at least 10 feet maximum, that that would encourage a user along the public walk to say, there is the door, I'm going in. Well, we have a McDonald's that's been there 30 years, it's back 75 feet. Placing a door in the front elevation in the dining room, which is very untypical of a McDonald's, um, to me does not offer or does not promote the neighborhood um, intent with a new structure. Uh, I believe that the amount of business that goes into the present entry on the north side is probably 98% of the people who come park on the north side and come in that entry. We have provided a connection to the, to the public walk, bike rack. Um, we have a seasonal patio and around here we haven't even approached spring and we're, and we're all wanting to sit outside but here we are and you know that outdoor area with the, with the decorative screening around will be there 100% of the time, but people will not be out there 100% of the time. Um, the, the added door at the front causes a um, little bit of a management issue because then the manager and staff, they're watching three doors. They've got two side doors, north and south. The south door, Surprisingly, will probably be a door that will be used by people choosing to eat outside at the patio. And the reason I say that is if a person gets an order, as you all know, at a McDonald's at the counter, you now get your drinks in a, you don't get your drinks, you get a cup. You go to self-service. Self-service is on the south side of the dining room near that door that is on the south side. People will have their bag, they'll get their drinks, and most likely will go out that door because they won't have to go along the other way. So it's very natural. Um, I believe that the, the walking through the dining room in order to get to the patio, which is only gonna be used by those who choose to eat outside, I don't think that they have to get involved with the other diners to get out to the patio. They have their own way to do it. So. I believe that of all the items that Ben had proposed or suggested, I think that's the one item that we have the most difficulty with. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Can yes, I ask yes. Mr. Martin a question? Yes, you can. The door, if you can look up, up here, I'm using my handy dandy mouse here. What if this door were to be eliminated and this area were to be redesigned to eliminate the door here and put the door over here. So that people, when there's a car that gets the order, has to wait over here to, to, to get the order. The person, instead of coming out this door, comes out a door here that's located closer to the patio area as a solution. Um, that's a good idea. But it turns out that uh, if you look at the floor plan of the building, uh, if you flip, somebody's got a floor plan. That's me. One sec. I saw it when you were flipping. Yeah, I'm, I gotta go back to the first Okay. Uh, this one? You went past it. The one just ahead of that one. That one. Um, what, what happens is the way that we position, the way that we position the drinks self-serve that is in that southeast corner, that's positioned so that the customers who receive their goods at the counter can go right there and then either go to their seat or leave the building. Uh, if they leave the building and go to the patio, they would go out that south door. The, the idea of having the customers who may be waiting for a special order along that south side as we're proposing, um, it's all service oriented on that south side and so to change the vestibule and put it at that other position would not only increase the cost of the renovation, but we just don't think it's necessary. We, we believe that 
the way it now functions and the way that we're trying to take an existing building to modify it to work within their budget, that this will suffice, this will do exactly what we would like it to do. Um, and I understand, I appreciate what you're suggesting. Um, I believe that the operation of the facility with that door and the way they now use it is, everyone is very common. Everyone is very used to what they're doing. And I don't really, again, I believe with a 75 foot distance from the street to the front of the building that the door in the front of the building does not to me have an impact on a negative impact on this building in this zoning. Can I? Yes, go ahead. I don't mean to. I don't mean to take over the. And I appreciate where you're coming from. Yeah. And I am in, in no me in no way trying to be adversarial. I'm just we're just talking, right? Yeah. We're having a professional conversation. Absolutely. Um, if you if you look at you you, did, you mentioned that um, when they they get their drinks they go out the south door when they when they go out the south door. There's no sidewalk, and there's there's no place. There to is walk. a sidewalk. Well, it, it goes through the. I guess you go out the door and walk through the. That's right. Through the dining, through the outdoor area. That's exactly area. right. Mm -hmm. I guess my, and we don't we don't have to come up with a solution right now. We yeah. don't. Just we're just talking. Yeah. I think one of the things that because it's in a neighborhood now, and because we're um, we've we kind of interpreted the uh, neighborhood no provisions to to basically the way we read it is you're eliminating part of the building that's going away. Um, but you're not increasing the nonconformity because you're creating a dynamic, exciting outdoor seating area. You just indicated that you're going to do some really cool things to make it kind of a more permanent, uh, you know, you're going to add structure and, and texture and all these cool elements to it. So we, we buy in, I think, to the, to the argument that it's no less, con no, it's not less conforming because we're doing all these cool, exciting things outside. Right. But I think one of the things that really helps to sell this and to drive this point home is a door in the front of the building. And I think, th I think that, that that's an important, important design element for, for the building to really, to, to, to have that relationship with the outdoor seating area. And I think, um, I think that's uh, something that you and, and your clients need to think about. Okay, I appreciate it. Mr. Martin, uh, you're saying that actually uh, in order to maintain the energy code, you have to have a vestibule. So if you had that where it is suggested, you would be actually projecting inside yes. the space and dividing the space up? Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. So, and both of our existing, I, excuse me, Tom, but both of our existing vestibule, both of our existing entrances, north and south, have vestibules, which, of course, for the energy code is what we want. You don't have to have them, but that's what we have. And yes, if we were to place that, I hadn't got into that yet because I was going to hopefully have a seating plan which would, yeah. which would show that I would be losing probably 10 seats if I end up doing that. Yeah, I, could, I could visualize that. Yeah. But more importantly, if that door were actually there in the front, supposedly yes. in the front, what is your opinion as far as it being utilized by the walk-in traffic from the street? Well, which is the intent of having yeah. it in the front. Well, that's the, uh, that's where I was headed in, in talking about being so close to the to the uh, sidewalk. I would venture to guess that the travelers along De Quinder at that location, south of 16 Mile Road, where it is, that the amount of travelers that we get on the public walk to come into that store are minuscule. And if there were a door at the front of the building, I am quite certain that that any guest who would come along that walk would not come in that door, but would go to the traditional door that everyone has used to. And I have to say that that door that is on the north side is probably 20 feet, maybe, uh, 22 feet from the corner of the building back. It has a very nice entry and a canopy and so forth. So um, the other part of it, I have to say, of positioning that door in the front where we were talking about off the patio and not, uh, not against what you said, Brent, in terms of that other side, 
but customers walking through the dining area while other customers are coming back and forth is a conflict. Now people are used to coming in parallel to the front counter, they go, part of them might leave, the other part might go and sit down. So there's, there's going to be a conflict that McDonald's usually doesn't deal with. And they are very, um, their interiors that you probably know are becoming much more sensitive to different seating arrangements. They have l less four tops, they have deuces, they have sixes, different kinds, and really gives an opportunity for people to have choices. And the thought of just coming through with a door at that position and meandering through the seats just to me doesn't make sense, but um, I'm listening. Yes, Mr. Edmonds. Would that door have signage above it that says exit to patio also? Oh yeah, it would, people would be direct. I mean, if if I were at the, now when you say door, the door that I'm suggesting, yeah, oh yes, there'd be signage for people to use the patio. We, uh, we have done patios in other places. That we did a store in Ferndale, at just south of Nine Mile, we renovated and we had some area in front and um, uh, have the same design and well, that, had a side door like this one does, and the patio people, I mean people who choose to sit on the patio, can see the patio, they know how to get there and they would be directed. Brent? What if you move that south door more eastward so that it comes more in line with the front, so that it looks more like a front door from the patio, it's not hidden behind a corner. Yeah, May, just suggestion. Um, that's possible, but it it all ends up like thousands of dollars in terms of in terms of the owner operator. That owner operator is going to invest probably a half a million dollars in this store doing what I have shown right now, and my in my opinion to move that door up and spend $5,000, $8,000 to move that door up. In my opinion, it doesn't necessarily make the store more neighborhood friendly. I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's my opinion. And if I, may, I, I understand that, I agree. Um, but it would help people uh, using that door mm -hmm. to, to, to see the patio area no, it was, mm -hmm. It's kind of blocked by that corner. I'm just mm -hmm. saying get them out further mm -hmm. so that they, when they re open the door, ah, I see a patio, as opposed yeah. to, oh, I open the door, now what? That's all I'm saying. I, I, I appreciate it. Any other comments or questions? Uh, maybe one more question. <clears throat> <The> practical. <clears throat> I'm looking at this diagram. I'm trying to remember my visits to McDonald's. But it seems to me that south door opens up right at the path of all these drive-through automobiles, and you've got to make a quick turn to get there. It just makes more sense to me to move that door also, and it invites people to the patio instead of having them go on a search for it. And you know, I'm not going to decide uh, whether to approve it or not yeah. based on a door. No, I understand. But I do think it makes a little more sense to move it. Well, well you know, I, I, I must say that there are two doors exiting this dining room. And um, the likelihood that customers, when the customers come in and they park on the north side, we are, we are products of habit. And you know, there's a good chance I'm gonna go back out that door and if I had a bag with some food in it and wanted to sit in the patio, there's a good chance I'm gonna head that way because when I finish, I'm gonna go to my car which is on the north side. I mean, simple as that. Now, the, the question becomes one of drive-through business. 75% of the business is through the drive-through window. And of course, there will be times when orders aren't quite right. And so cars will be able to, of course, pull up and that door on the south side is probably gonna be used most often by staff who are gonna go and handle customers who need their special order or one that was not made properly. Um, we are eliminating that one space, which ended up being a spot that uh, special orders people could go, but by eliminating it, it gives us about maybe 50, 60 feet of straight shot where cars could just parallel 
kind of in a sitting standing so that somebody can come and just deliver. So I, I understand what you're all saying and um, I will go back to McDonald's, talk about it, and uh, hopefully we'll see you. I mean, if there are other questions, I'm glad to answer them if I could. But I, I believe that we have uh, bent over, not backwards, but bent over in order to work with Ben and everyone here to, again, take a 30-year-old McDonald's that's had the zoning changed and we were put in a position because of the zoning change to try to deal with a concept that uh, the building wasn't designed for at the time. Uh, we don't think that concept is gonna change the way McDonald's does business. We think that it's still gonna have 75% of the business through the drive-through and we still think that we're gonna service customers in a very good way, so. Mr. Kempen? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that you're saying. Uh, operationally, I understand McDonald's is top-notch and they, they think about all these little details about flow and, you know, pushing customers through so they're not backed up at the drive-through and everything else. And all the customers appreciate that. Uh, if you are one of those people who's in the dining room, uh, you're probably a creature of habit as well and you're going to walk into the dining room and not very many McDonald's have a patio like that. So unless you're real familiar with this one, my guess is that you're going to wander into the dining room and then see a patio out there. It would be really inviting as a customer to have a, a way out onto the dining or patio area from within the dining room as well. And I think that if you could work that into the design, I'm not saying you need to even interfere with the other two doors. I understand operationally you need runners to catch the drive-throughs and you get people parking, you don't want them running through the dining room, but for the diners, they're the ones gonna be using the patio, in my opinion, as well. <clears throat> one of the other things that I, I, that I, and I understand what you're saying, one of the other things that Mr. Stratt brought up is about the vestibule. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have an outside door, you'd wanna have a vestibule. So um, the question not only of, not only of um, reducing seating in the dining room, because a vestibule has gotta be at least five feet wide by about seven feet long. So that's 35 square feet plus the aisle to get to it. So that considerably reduces numbers of seats. Plus it's an, it's, it's an element in this, in this dining room that we would have to deal with um, decor wise and design wise. So, you know, uh, I can only say that I will go back to McDonald's and share your thoughts and, um, and, and with the owner operator, who's the one who's paying half of the bill, uh, McDonald's is working with them to in, try to upgrade these facilities. And my, I was starting uh, to simply mention that we have a store that is 25 or 30 years old that we know will be, uh, it, the end result will be such an improvement over what you now have and see no mansards, no light beams, no roof beams, none of that uh, looking like the new store. So I'll take everything into account and put together a revised drawing. Several hands were up. Mr. Schultz, did you have a question? I, first of all, I think we've just about beaten it before. <laughs> um, every McDonald's that I have ever been in has a door in this exact same location so that if you walk out it and you happen to step off the sidewalk, you're going to be creamed by a car coming out of their drive-through. Even the brand new ones that are being, that have just been built at Big Beaver and Rochester has the same situation where you walk outside and if you make a right turn, you're directly in front of traffic coming through the drive-through. McDonald's have been this way since before they had <laughs> drive-throughs and Personally, I don't have a problem with the door staying right where it is. I think we've just wasted about a half hour talking about it. Mr. Sanzica. I'm just curious, what are your hours of operation? I guess. I think that's a 24 hour store. Okay, because I, I was interested in about the dimming of the lights. Uh, the what? The dimming, dimming of the dimming lights? The lights after yeah, that's an interesting thing. I've not been involved with a, a, a site plan or a project that that has been a requirement. So it's, it's uh, new to me. So it, it'll, I'll have to be directed. But safety, of course, is an issue. 
and lighting. Uh, and you know, we aren't blowing light all over the place outside of our right of ways. And uh, so we'll deal with that when you tell me. Hey, Mr. Strick. Yeah, speaking of horses that was uh, <laughs> just mentioned, uh, I really think that each and every one of us should tell Mr. Martin, who is a professional architect, he's done there all these, I think each and one of us should tell him where we think the door should be so we can end up with a camel that was originally designed as a horse. I, I really, I think that this is ridiculous, sitting here listening to this for as long as we have for the past half hour, in my opinion, I, I agree with Mr. Schultz. I, this is where it belongs. I respect your opinion, and I think that's where it should go. Thank you. But, but I have to tell you that I listened to every one of you to understand where you're coming from and what your thoughts are. That's all there is to it. Thanks so much. Did I cut you off? Did you have another question? No. Okay. Thank you. Here. All right. Now I think it's appropriate to what? I was going to, if you're about to say, open the public hearing, I won't say a thing. <laughs> All right, yes, we'll open the public hearing. If there's anyone who would like to speak to this item, seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the table. Um, again, do we need a, a vote on the postponement? Okay, somebody would like to make a motion. I move we postpone this until a new submission of a site plan is given. Thank okay. you. Second by Mr. Schultz, Mr. Carlisle. I, since it's a special use, we need a date certain. Okay. Of the public hearing. It's scheduled uh, meeting June, of the June planning 11th. commission. If, June June 11th. if the petitioner can be ready by then. June 11th, good. Right, we'll, we'll put June 11th and I'll be in touch with your department to make sure that I can be ready. Okay. Just remember we have to have it ahead of time so that they can review right, it and we can review it. The date is the right. yeah. Good job. All right. Roll call. Thank you, Kathy. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Strack? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Kempen? Yes. Mr. Crent? Yes. Mr. Sanzig? Yes. Thank you. See you in a month. <coughs> All, right. All right. Item number nine. Are there any one in the audience who would like to make a comment with regards to items that are on the agenda? Appreciate you sticking with us. <laughs> uh, and uh, number 10, planning commissioner comments. We have the honor of having a city attorney with us today. Would you like to start, Lori? Any comments, anything? Uh, I'm just happy to be here. And uh, you know, I don't get a chance to, uh, to come to the planning commission, but uh, it's good to see that you're doing good work. And um, even though you didn't act on anything tonight. <laughs> yeah, really, four postponements. <laughs> Is that a record? <laughs> Mr. Savadon. Those of you uh, who watched the city council meeting last night uh, know that um, Zota, zoning, zoning Ordinance Text Amendment 245, Sober Living Facilities, has been sent back to the Planning Commission for further study. The city council uh, members are going to provide questions and concerns, and the Planning Commission is going to work on tweaking the proposed language to address those concerns. So expect to discuss that item in the very near future. Oh yes, the city council is also talking about scheduling a joint meeting with the planning commission. Good. Potentially talk about sober living facilities as well as talk about the um, update to the master plan. As long as we're talking about joint meetings, uh, anything with the engineering department? <laughs> Nothing to report. <laughs> I'm sure you've extended an invitation. Uh, yeah, we can, we'll talk offline, Mr. Chairman. All right. Mr. Hudson? Well, Brent gave me a nice segue talking about updating a master plan. Um, I was in Hilton Head Island this spring and also in uh, Schaumburg, Illinois over the weekend, which is a community very similar to Troy, and noticed both of these communities had bike paths in the roadway. And I think as part of the master plan, if that fits in, we ought to consider uh, maybe uh, including that as part of our update. Thank you. Just one quick thought, uh, how important zoning is. Um, I'm sure everybody's aware of what happened in West uh, Texas uh, with the fertilizer plant. And uh, just one great example of uh, how, why we need zoning. Mr. Kempen, any comments? No comments today. 
Mr. Stratt. Uh, I would like again to extend an invitation to the new city manager to come in and introduce himself and let us have a bit of a discussion. I don't know if you had a chance to see there is going to be kind of a meet and greet. Um, I wish I could remember the date. June, maybe the 23rd. But I will try to get through through Brent, get you some information on that, and you certainly all would be welcome through the chamber. Not to preclude him coming in and chatting with us. <laughs> not, not, not to be flippant or arrogant, but I think most people would agree that after city council, this is probably the most important board that this city has, and I really think the city manager could come in and meet at least briefly with the planning commission and give us his vision and that sort of thing. Yeah, I have to apologize. I heard city manager, I didn't hear city manager. I heard the new president of the chamber. No, so, city sorry. manager. <laughs> Mr. Edmonds. Well, I can't pass up the opportunity to, to uh, at least, uh, since we're blessed with the uh, presence of Ms. Bloom, is there, is there hope for the transit center? <laughs> we are exploring options right now, and there are options that are available. So um, city council will be having to take some action. Uh, it will be in a public meeting. Um, but at this point in time, we are exploring what the options are. And, and just a quick follow-up maybe for Brent. Has, has work on the site ceased? Work, work, work does continue on the site um, at this point in time, and it, and it will continue. Um, but again, that's part of the exploration of our options. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Sanzica. Yes, just uh, briefly, I had the pleasure of uh, attending an engineering conference uh, where the, uh, I think it was the executive director of the Michigan Municipal League spoke, and, and, and his topic was, you know, maintaining youth, uh, the younger adults in our community, and, and his plan, and it was a very excellent uh, speech. It did a great, I believe his name was Mr. Dan Gilbert, if I'm Dan not mistaken. Gilbert. Did an excellent speech, and uh, one of the things that I noted was uh, the issue of, of entertainment, entertainment in our community, and I, and I, and, I, and I noticed that, you know, one of his points was a thousand nights. You know, if you have 50 nights a week, or 50 nights a, uh, 50 weeks a year, two nights a week, for ten, uh, that's 100 nights uh, a year. For 10 years, it's a thousand nights. That there should be opportunities for the youth, for the younger adults to be able to attend something for a thousand nights in our community. And, and, and that's something that I think we sorely miss. I don't think there's any entertainment that I'm aware of, a very minimal amount of entertainment, any theaters, any uh, music, any type of uh, uh, anything for our young uh, adults or even older adults that w do enjoy that type of thing. So in our master plan, I think I'd really like to um, look into that and encourage that. And uh, and if, if we ever have an opportunity to, to have that gentleman speak to us, I think it, it, it will be well worth him coming to talk to us. Yeah, I heard an interview with him just yesterday. Uh, he and the city manager of Marquette talking about, you know, the cities and, and how they can be placemaking, and it was an excellent uh, interview. So. Yeah, I know he did use Ann Arbor as a big example of how to do that, and he, sh uh, he did show the um, Zitterman's Bakery, or uh, Deli, and mm -hmm. where they had picnic tables right against the curb, and, uh, you know, there's a line waiting for, to, for people to use those uh, to be, uh, to attend in that facility, and it's just, this is exactly what we're talking about. I know we're doing great things in the city of Troy. I think it's uh, very, I think we should all be commended on our master plan and our zoning ordinance, but I think, you know, there's more that we can do, and I think uh, some of those things as such as entertainment would be, would be very worthwhile. Thank you. Mr. Carlisle? Um, I'll be brief. Uh, I want to compliment the Planning Commission. I think there were three tough items tonight in front of you, and it was- You swept were, them all under the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> you, you punted the, punted the ball forward. Um, um, but I also want to remind the, and, and, and to beat a dead horse, I want to remind the Planning Commission that um, as the economy picks up, we're seeing more and more redevelopments. Um, and we're going to see more and more site plans that come in that are non-conforming site plans that are looking for improvement. Um, the hardest issue to deal with from a planning standpoint is addressing non-conformities. And this is especially difficult in the form-based district, which is a, a, a total paradigm shift of how we've done conventional development in Troy. 
And the only thing I'd just remind the Planning Commission is that when these come in for, for site plan approval, um, it's our, really our only chance to really bring them up into some sort of compliance. And so don't lose the opportunity to, to ensure that they meet the requirements of the zoning ordinance and, and the vision of what the city intends for these areas. Um, it's, our, it's our opportunity, it's a lost opportunity if we don't take advantage of it. That's all. Thank you, well said. Kathy? Nothing. Nothing? Well, a very good meeting. Thank you all. We're adjourned.